Okay, we're getting a little bit of a late start uh, later than we thought we would. Um, so you may have trouble getting to the open house by five o'clock. But if post-mortem survival is a reality, <laughs> then we don't have to worry so much about time. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. <laughs> the belief that we survive bodily death has been around for millennia. But it's only been regarded as a scientific hypothesis for the past hundred years or so. The belief in survival is often attributed to our fear of annihilation or our wish to be immortal. But more cautionally, it's also been fueled by experiences that people have that suggest to us that at least some part of us does survive bodily death. There are some people who still believe that survival is a religious belief that is not amenable to scientific exploration. But I'm going to try to show you that survival can be operationalized as a scientifically testable hypothesis by focusing not on the belief itself, but on the experiences that give rise to it. Here we go. More than 40 years ago, there was a division started at the University of, of Virginia in the Department of Psychiatry with the express purpose of studying scientifically the question of whether we survive bodily death. The group has gone through a series of name changes since then, but now it is the Division of Perceptual Studies in the Department of Psychiatry and Neurobehavioral Sciences at UVA. And still after 40 years, we focus mainly on survival. The founder of this group, Ian Stevenson, was also one of the co-founders of the SSE a quarter century ago. For most of our life, we lived in this small frame house built in the 1920s, just off the main UVA grounds. Those of you who have come to past SSE conferences in Charlottesville may have visited us, us there. It was a great place for thinking and writing but when trucks drove by, the whole house shook, which made it hard to do EEG recordings. We currently have seven doctoral level research faculty, two research assistants, and a variety of students and volunteers that uh, vary in number from time to time. About a year ago, we moved into a new facility, which I hope you'll visit after this. It's about a mile across town, just off the downtown mall. And this building houses our offices, the Ian Stevenson Memorial Library, and our state of the, e state of the lab EEG lab with a uh, electromagnetically shielded room. Um, throughout all these changes, our mission has remained the same to investigate the scientific hypothesis that death is not annihilation, but ra merely rather a change of state. There's, there are actually many hypotheses uh, that imply postmortem survival. And I'm going to focus on just three hypotheses that have received the most empirical testing. They are that people who are now living have lived before, which is usually cast in terms of reincarnation, although it doesn't have to be. The hypothesis that people who are now deceased are still existing in some sense and the hypothesis that the mind can function independent of the physical brain. Now the first one, the idea that people who are now living have lived before, is basically that something that incorporates the personality survives death of the body and then reappears in a new body. Ian Stevenson almost single-handedly created this field of research. When you think about reincarnation type cases, the stereotype people usually think of is the Bridie Murphy, type, Bridie Murphy type story from the 1950s, where a housewife with no previous unusual experiences underwent hypnosis at a cocktail party and started talking in an Irish brogue and talking about a... a there are a number of problems with those types of reincarnation memory. 
And they all boil down to what's called cryptomnesia or source amnesia, which is basically knowing something but forgetting where you do it from, where you learn it. And memories that come to people as adults are highly vulnerable to cryptomnesia. You have a lot of experiences, it's hard to keep track of where they came from. Also, experience and memories that come up under hypnosis are very vulnerable to cryptomnesia. So for these reasons, Ian Stevenson usually, almost always, refused to deal with memories that came up in adulthood or under hypnosis. Instead, he focused on young children, usually preschool children, who had memories spontaneously coming up about a past life. In the last 40 years, we've accumulated some 2,700 cases of children who have these past life memories. Now, this is not easy research to do. Most of these children live in countries where there was a belief in reincarnation. And these are generally in the Southeast Asia cultures. These kids usually live in remote villages, quite far from any means of transportation. And it's hard to get there. This is Dr. Stevenson doing one of his field trips. In addition, almost none of these children will speak English. So you almost always have to go through an interpreter. This is a typical scene of being talking to a young girl with her parents present and the interpreter present. So what kinds of evidence do we get from these children? Most importantly, are the very friendly cognitive memories that the child comes up with. Names, dates, places, specific details linked to the past life, which we can then check out against the facts of the person the child came to have been in the past life. This past life usually occurs in another village, far away from this one, sometimes in a different country, of which the child, the subject, has to have no possible knowledge. Secondly, most of these kids have personality traits and likes and dislikes that are very unusual for their family and which they attribute to the past life. For example, a child born to a Hindu family in India may refuse to eat the food his mother prepares and insists he wants food cooked for a Muslim family because he remembers a life in a Muslim family. Children who remember a past life of a different gender will often want to dress and play with toys that are appropriate to the opposite gender. There were a number of boys born in Burma in the 1950s who claimed to remember lives as Japanese fighter pilots who were shot down over Burma in World War II. And these kids in remote jungle areas of Burma would have traits that people in Burma associated with the Japanese. They would want to wear pants rather than the skirt-like longi that the Burmese men wear. They'd want to eat raw fish instead of the spicy Burmese food and so on. Some of these kids also have skills that they were not taught and that their family does not know. Occupational skills, um, ability to play musical instruments, sometimes speaking a language that is not spoken in their district. We have, for example, children in a Sinhalese family in, in Sri Lanka who speak Tamil and their families don't. And then we also have children who have birthmarks or birth defects that they relate to the death wounds on the person they claim to have been previously. And these are usually very unusual birthmarks and birth defects that make no sense in terms of normal embryological development. And let me show you what I mean by that. These are the hands of a Burmese boy who remembered a life as a highway brigand, a life that was cut short when he was captured by vigilantes. He was about to be beheaded by a swordsman, and he held up his hands in a gesture of supplication to plead for his life. And his hands were chopped off. And this is how he was born. This is a boy born in India who remembered a life as a teenager in which he had an accident feeding fodder into an automatic chopping machine. He was feeding the fodder in with his right hand and operating the machine with his left hand. And his right hand got caught and the right hand was cut off. <laughs> 
This is the back of the head of a young girl in Nigeria from the Igbo tribe who remembered the life of a man who had had brain surgery for an intracranial tumor. And she was born with this remarkable scar in the back of her head. Again, these birthmarks, these birth defects, make no sense in terms of what we know of embryological development. Paul von Ward, who is not associated with our group, claims to, to have found amazing similarities in the facial geometry of people who remember a past life and the person they claim to have been in a past life. And he's matched up photographs of the present person and the past life person. And he's developed six biometric ratios that he claims are more similar in these matched pairs than with control subjects. The difficulty with Von Ward's data is that these measurements were not done blindly. Von Ward himself made the measurements on the subjects and on the photos of the deceased persons. So what we would like to do is try to replicate his findings in a blind manner. That is, have one person make the measurements on the subject, have a different person make the measurements on photos of the deceased person, and then a third person who doesn't know which is which, see if they can match up the correct person with the deceased. One of the problems we're going to have, though, is we have a very limited sample of photographs of the deceased person. Most of these are in remote areas in underdeveloped countries, but we do have some. The second hypothesis about survival is that people who are now deceased are still surviving in some form. And we have lots of evidence that contributes to this hypothesis. Most commonly are interactive apparitions. And these are, I'm not talking about ghosts in haunted houses that just wander through and don't talk to you. I'm talking about visions, apparitions, that interact and respond meaningfully with you. These often occur around the time of the death of the person who's dead. And they will communicate meaningful things to the person who's having the vision. There have been some attempts in recent years to try to induce these communications with interactive visions. Raymond Moody, who coined the term near-death experience, developed what he called the psychomantium, which is essentially a uh, sensory deprivation room in which, after an elaborate ritual, people will go into this room and try to invoke a vision of the deceased. And in some cases, with some good facilitators, people do have these interactive visions. There's a psychologist in the VA system named Al Botkin, who was using EMDR to treat uh, veterans with post-traumatic stress. And he found serendipitously that some of them, as he was doing this, would have visions of their fallen comrades that interacted with them. And this turned out to be so therapeutic for the vets that he started trying to induce it using EMDR and suggestion and in fact has claimed a fair amount of success in getting them to introduce these visions which are interactive and communicate in two ways. Then we have communication through mediums. And you've heard this excellent presentation from Julie. I won't repeat what she said. I will tell you though that our lab, Emily Kelly in our division, has replicated this work with slightly different technology and found equally impressive results. This has been done, as you know, by Gary Schwartz's lab, by our lab, um, uh, by a group in Scotland, Archie Roy and Tricia Ritchie. Um, so it's been replicated in several places now in the last couple of decades. Julie told you about the elaborate controls we try to put in to make sure that the medium isn't getting sensory cues from the sitter or using super psi from the sitter. There's another type of data from mediumship sittings that eliminates that possibility. And that's what's called a drop-in communicator. These are allegedly deceased people who come to a mediumship session, a seance, and no one in the room, neither the medium nor the sitters, knows this person. These are unusual. They provide great evidence because you can't get the information by normal means but they're rare. 
However, Ian Stevenson found more than 60, 60 of these in the published literature. Let me give you an example. In a small village of about 5,000 people in Tuscany, there was a day laborer who in his 20s developed mediumship abilities. And he used to give seances. He didn't charge for them. 10 local villagers would come. One of them would take ver verbatim notes. And he would have these seances periodically. And at one point, a communicator appeared at one of these seances and said his name was Giuseppe Riccardi. And he was a Roman Catholic priest in Canton, Ohio. No one in the room knew of this fellow. He said that he had been shot with a revolver by one of his parishioners after he completed mass. Father Riccardi appeared in a couple of more seances over the period of the next couple of years. In all the times he appeared, no one in the room had ever heard of Father Riccardi. At one of these seances, there was an Italian researcher present who wrote to Ian Stevenson and said, this guy says he lived in Ohio. Can you track down whether he really did? Well, we didn't have a date of death, so it wasn't easy. But one of our research assistants contacted the archdiocese in Youngstown, Ohio, and confirmed that there was a Giuseppe Riccardi who had been the parish priest in Canton, Ohio for four years before he was shot by a parishioner. He had just finished mass, everyone left, and one woman came in, pointed a gun at him, and said a few words, and then shot him. He lived long enough to ask her, uh, why did you do this? And by what he said to the medium, she gave an answer that he didn't understand. Now that we had the date of death from the archdiocese, he we went to the newspapers, and we found reports in several Ohio newspapers about this, confirming the details of it. So everything that the medium came up with in Italy turned out to be true. We then contacted the researcher in Italy and said, now we, here's the date at which this happened. Go back and check the Italian newspapers. No account had appeared in the newspapers that were circulating in this small village in Tuscany. They eventually found one report in a newspaper in Rome that did report the death of Father Giuseppe Riccardi. And the newspaper account placed it in Canton, China, <laughs> which is about 20 times the size of Canton, Ohio, so it's a logical mistake. So it's unlikely that this medium had gotten the information by any normal means. One other way you might be able to differentiate super psi from survival is by evidence of strong motivation on the part of the deceased, the discarnate, to communicate. And there's another remarkable drop-in communicator that Ian and Erlander Haraldson from Iceland studied. They were doing studies of the professional Icelandic medium, um, Hafstein Björnsson. And at one of Björnsson's uh, seances, a character appeared and said that he had been buried without his leg that had been dismembered shortly before death. And he wanted the leg buried with the body. No one in the room knew what he was talking about. No one recognized the story. This discarnate, this alleged discarnate, reappeared many times in different Hofstein Bjornsson seances with different sitters present, and none of them ever recognized the story. But eventually, he gave enough detail that they were able to find the leg and bury it in the anonymous graveyard in the church that he claimed was his. After that happened, he never appeared again. That suggests some motivation on the part of some entity that is no longer with us. Okay, we also have evidence from instrumental transcommunication, what used to be called electronic voice phenomena. These are situations in which an alleged discarnate seems to be communicating through some mechanical device now it's usually electromagnetic, like a telephone, or a television, or a radio, or a computer. One of the difficulties with this research is that the signals usually come through on top of white noise. And there are some 
subject the character to trying to interpret what you're hearing. So there's not much of this research done here. There's a lot done in Europe still, though. And then we have decoding of encrypted messages. Back in the late 1800s, some of the founders of the Society for Psychological Research decided to plan evidence for survival. So they would leave encrypted messages with the idea that after they died, they would communicate post-mortem the key to decipher the message. Now back in the 1800s, that would have been hard to do. You could, it would have been hard to decipher messages without knowing the key. Now, it's very simple with a computer. So Ian Stevenson developed a modification of this. And we have combination padlocks that you can set the combination to. Now, the idea is that you would set the combination to your lock and then memorize a mnemonic device, a phrase or a word, that can be translated into a series of numbers that will open the lock. You never write down the combination or the mnemonic. So the key to opening the lock exists only in your mind and nowhere else. And then after you die, you will communicate the key. We have some two dozen locks in our office. And none of them, for none of them have we gotten the combination uh, committed, transmitted to, to us yet. The third hypothesis I mentioned was that, oops, was that the mind can function independent of the brain. Now this is not a sufficient condition for survival, but it is a necessary condition for survival. If you don't have mind functioning without brain, then you don't have survival because the brain most likely does die. We have lots of evidence for this. In fact, Several of my colleagues recently published this book, Irreducible Mind, with 800 pages of very densely packed evidence, mostly from medical journals, of mind functioning without the brain or independent of the brain. I won't read it to you now. <laughs> but I will mention some of the more dramatic lines of evidence. First is deathbed recovery of lost mental function. This happens typically in people who have Dementia, who have been unable to recognize people for decades, people with chronic schizophrenia who have been psychotic for decades, and then on their deathbeds, they suddenly become rational, lucid, remember family members, speak coherently. Now this is extremely rare. Most people with dementia do not recover before death. But that it happens at all is something material science cannot explain. How often does it happen? We don't know. If you talk to hospice workers, they will say, oh yeah, I've got lots of examples of that. But there's almost nothing written in the medical literature about it. Nevertheless, we found 79 cases in the medical literature of people with severe dementia or chronic psychoses who in the hours before death or sometimes in the days before death suddenly became lucid again. Then we have people with normal intelligence with minimal brain tissue. And this is brought to our attention by a British uh, neurologist, John Lorber, who is specializing in severe hydrocephalus, uh, usually children who have the cerebral ventricles, which are filled with fluid, tremendously swollen so that it presses on the brain. And in some of these cases, you have just a tiny couple of millimeters of cerebral cortex around the outside of the ventricles. Some of these are so severe, it's hard to imagine the child even living, let alone having a normal intelligence. And in fact, most of them do not have normal intelligence, but some do. In fact, some have high intelligence. One of Lorber's colleagues at the University of Cambridge, where he worked, was a math, math professor and said to Lorber one day, I've got a grad student whose head is so big, it looks like one of your Sidrosophala kids. Would you take a look at him? So Lorber did. On the left is a normal brain scan. The stippled area is cortex, and the dark area in the middle is the ventricles full of fluid. On the right is this 26-year-old grad student in math at Cambridge with virtually no cerebral cortex, but functioning as a grad student in math at Cambridge. <laughs> 
Who else have we got? We have evidence from near-death experiences, a variety of things about near-death experiences that relate to survival of death. First, almost all near-death experiences report that their thinking processes during the NDE was faster and clearer than it ever has been before at a time when their brains were impaired. And in some of these cases, we have very good documentation of the brains being impaired. For example, in cardiac arrest, where there is no blood going to the brain. And yet, these people say, my thinking was better than ever. Almost as if, as they say, my mind was free of the limitations of the physical brain. One fellow that I interviewed was a guy who had overdosed on medications in a suicide attempt and then started hallucinating, and he was seeing uh, little humanoid figures around him. And then he had started having second thoughts about the suicide attempt. So he tried to make it from his bed where he was to a telephone. And he was having a very hard time because these humanoid figures were stopping, were getting in his way. And at that point, he drew out of his body, and from a position about 10 feet behind his body, his thinking suddenly became crystal clear. And he looked at his body, and his body was looking around confusedly. And from where he was, 10 feet behind, he could not see these humanoid figures. But he remembered being in the body hallucinating. So here we have a brain that's still hallucinating, while the subject, the person, out of the body is not hallucinating. So how does medical science make sense of that? We also have accurate perceptions from an out-of-body perspective. We have lots of examples of this, lots of quote anecdotes about this. One of my favorites is a fellow that I knew in Connecticut named Al Sullivan, who was a truck driver. And during open heart surgery, he left his body. And as he described it, he saw the surgeon flapping his wings as if he was trying to fly. Now, I've been in medicine for four decades. I've never seen a surgeon do this. But Al described it to me. He said, yep, he's going like this. I said, well, did you ask him about it? He said, yeah. After the surgery, I asked the surgeon, why were you doing that? And he said, the surgeon got very red faced and said, who told you about that? And Al said, nobody told me. I saw it. When you killed me, I withdrew with, left my body, and I watched it. And the surgeon got very angry and said, well, you're here now, aren't you? I must have, I must have done something, right? And that was the end of the conversation. <laughs> By the time Al told me this, it was several years later, so I figured it was safe for me to talk to the surgeon. So I did. And I asked him about this. And he said that he had developed this habit of letting his residents start the surgery and then he would go in after they got started. And he had scrubbed his hands. They were gowned and gloved. And he wasn't going to operate. He was going to just watch them for a while. He wanted to make sure he didn't touch anything that wasn't sterile and contaminate his hands. So he put them where he knew they wouldn't touch anything. And then he supervised them. You know, pull over there a little more. No, come over there. No. I've never seen anybody else do this. This doesn't happen on house or ER. I don't think Al could have seen it. So are these just anecdotes? Jan Holden has looked at the literature of veridical perception in near-death experiences. And she found 107 cases in the published literature. Of those, there were 98 that were completely accurate. There were only eight that had any inaccuracy at all in them. Of those 98 that were completely accurate, 41 were corroborated as being accurate by a third party. Now, in spite of all these, quote, anecdotes, we don't have any experimental verification of this, controlled studies. There have been a few people who tried to plant targets where patients might have NDEs. Now, the skeptics like to say, well, with all the controlled studies you've done, you've never had a single person out of their body seeing something accurately? Well, all these studies we've done have looked at a total of 12 people so far. 
And when I ask near-death experiences to explain why they don't do this in a controlled study, they always bring up the problem of motivation. When I'm out of my body, marveling at what's going on, why would I pay attention to what you've designated as the target? And I don't have an answer for that. We also have people who are blind from birth, who during their near-death experiences claim to be able to see and can describe later things, including color, that they have never seen before. We also have lots of stories of people in a near-death experience seeing deceased relatives. They almost never report seeing living relatives. Well, that's what you would expect if they're really seeing the deceased. That's also what you'd expect if they were just going through wishful thinking, wishing I would see my deceased loved ones. But there is a type of deceased relative or deceased person that you can't explain on the basis of wishful thinking. And these are what's called the Peak and Darien cases. And that comes from a book by Francis Power Cobb in 1882 called The Peak and Darien. And these are cases in which the person who is dying sees a deceased person that no one knew was dead. We have many cases of this in the literature. And I'll tell you about a couple of them just to give you an example of what they're like. Back in 1885, Eleanor Sidgwick, one of the founders of the Society for Psychical Research, published this case of a wealthy English woman who hired a local teenager to teach her girls how to sing. This is a girl who had a, a beautiful singing voice. So she had this girl come in a couple of days a week to teach her kids how to sing until the girl became old enough to leave home, in which case she, which time she left, went to London to try to make a career as a singer. Seven years later, this wealthy English woman is on her deathbed. And she comes conscious again and says, I heard the most beautiful singing, like angels welcoming me to heaven. And then I recognized the voice, and it was Julia. And shortly after that, she died. Her husband assumed she was delirious. <clears throat> Until two days later, he saw a copy of the London Times that had Julia's obituary. The same day his wife died. In 1983, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross published a number of these cases. One was a Native American woman who was in a car accident on the side of the road out west in a remote area where there weren't many cars passing by. And she was in very bad shape. Another motorist eventually came by, stopped, as people do out west, to ask if he could help. And she said, I don't think I'm gonna make it. If you ever get to the reservation down the road, tell my mother I'm okay because I'm with my father. He had a cell phone, he called the rescue squad but she died before they got there. He was so moved by being there at the right time that he went out of his way to go to the reservation and find this woman's mother. The mother said that her husband, this woman's father, had died just a couple of hours earlier of a heart attack in another part of the state. One more case. This was a nine-year-old boy in Pittsburgh who had severe meningitis. And it was so severe that they weren't sure he was going to live through the night. So his parents spent the night in the hospital with him. In the morning, his fever broke. He became conscious again. And he told the family very excitedly that he had been in heaven and had seen his deceased relatives, his grandparents. He talked about Uncle Luigi. And he said, and Teresa was there also. That was his older sister. He said she looked beautiful. Um, it was just so good to see her again. And the father got very upset and said, what are you talking about? Your sister is perfectly fine. She's up in, in college in, in Vermont. I talked to her yesterday. She's perfectly fine. And the little boy said, she told me I have to come back, but she's going to stay there with Grandma and Grandpa. The father was so upset 
he told the doctor to give the boy a sedative to shut him up. The doctor said to the father, you've been under a lot of stress, you've been up all night, go home and get some rest. So the father did. And he immediately, when he got home, called his daughter. And he found that the college had been trying to call him all night long. She had been killed in a car accident the night before. Okay, so where does this leave us? None of these stories about NDEs are controlled studies. They're all just anecdotes. Some of them are open to other explanations besides survival. But I would say that if you combine all the phenomena from NDEs with all the data from mediumship cases, from all the data, with all the data from reincarnation cases, and put all these things together, the most parsimonious explanation is that some aspect of the human body survives death. And just to remind you before you leave, this is where we are now. Here's the Cavalier Inn, there's the chapel, and you can get the trolley, which is green, dark green trolley for free, anywhere here along these dots. It'll take you down University Avenue to Main Street, to Water Street. Um, if you're walking or driving, you go down Water Street here to 10th Street, and Dops is right there. If you're taking the trolley, it crosses the downtown mall and comes this way and tells me when I get off at 10th Street. And that's where we are. And the trolley stops at 10.30, 10, I'm sorry, 11.30 tonight. There's two 10th Street stuff, right? Yes, 10th Street Northeast. Now, we have, uh, a, Dr. Grace has been uh, presented both a moving and a very efficient talk. And there is a little bit of time in, in principle <laughs> you may all want to go and just meditate on this, but I bet there are a few questions. It is, sorry. Sure. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about Chester Carlson's uh, support of your work? I read his biography, it was fascinated and inspired by this person, but it didn't say much about his uh, belief. Did he believe in survival or why did he yeah. support this work? Chester Carlson was the inventor of the Xerox process, yeah. and he made a fortune with that, and towards the end of his life, started getting interested in Buddhism and decided to spend some of his fortune studying the question of survival. He had heard about these children in India uh, who remembered their previous lives. He heard about it from Eileen Garrett. So he looked around for somebody to go investigate these and he settled on Ian Stevenson, who was a well-known chairman of psychiatry who had a good reputation in studying memory. So he said to Ian, who was open to this idea, I'll pay your trip to India if you go investigate these kids for me. And he gave him the names of a couple of kids. Ian did that. And while he was over there, quickly found a couple dozen more. He came back, wrote up a report, gave it to Carlson, and thought that was the end of it. A few years later, when Carlson died, he left in his will enough money to start this division. So that's why I'm the Chester Carlson Professor of Psychiatry. Um, I, I'd like you to uh, perhaps recharacterize your data. Uh, you're dismissing your stuff as just an anecdote. Yeah. Um, you have a case series, right, which is a superior form of data to a, an anecdote. If you had one, it could be dismissed as an anecdote. Thank you. You have more than an anecdote, so don't disparage your data. Thank you. <laughs> Bruce, uh, you would be how fast do you run? 
depends on what you mean by my colleagues. <laughs> when, when, we, when we first started doing this research back in the late 70s, early 80s, no one had heard about these things. And we did a, we did a, a panel at the um, 1980 American Medical Association, and Mike Sabom, a cardiologist, was there, and Ken Ring, and a couple of others. And we had a packed crowd. It was, they really wanted to hear about this. But after we finished talking, there was a lot of silence in the room. And one person stood up and said, I've been a cardiologist for 30 years. I've never heard a single one of these stories. How do you know these people aren't just making it up? And then someone else stood up and said, I'm one of his patients, and I still wouldn't tell him about my Miami. <laughs> now when we give these same talks, it's very common to have doctors in the audience stand up and tell about their near-death experiences. So it is becoming more common. Having said that, you all know that the powers that control the medical journals and certainly the NIH and NSF, this isn't their favorite topic. So it's hard to get funding, it's hard to get publications, but there's becoming more and more of a grassroots effort. And one of the things I like about teaching in the medical school is that we're infecting the next generation of doctors. So as uh, Max Planck said, science progresses funeral by funeral. <laughs> Unless there are some announcements, I would personally like to thank you all for being here. <laughs>